can I remind members that the committee meeting will be recorded and broadcast throughout Parliament buildings as well as online. There are four members here in person today and we are going to have two members eventually via video conference and John O'Dowd is there in his capacity as Carolyn Cullen's deputy and Mark H is joining us later on. And in the room we've got myself, Emma Sheeran, Mike Nesbitt, the Vice Chair, Paula Bradshaw and Michelle McGovern. Uh, let's see. Apologies. We've got just apologies for Mr Stalford who is still on well and who won't be attending. Oh, have we calved? <laughs> I thought that was somebody's phone. I was like, it's definitely not me. John. Okay, can we proceed? Sorry. So our first briefing is um, a briefing on rights and peace building by Dr. Amanda Cahill Ripley. Today we'll receive a briefing from Dr. Amanda Cahill Ripley from the University of Liverpool, who specialises in economic, social and cultural rights. Her recent research explores the intersections between socio-economic rights and peace building, including research with borderland Protestant unionist and loyalist communities. The clerk's memos can be found uh, from page five of the meeting papers, and also included in your packs is Amanda's written submission. And I'd like to welcome Dr. Cahill Ripley to the meeting. Amanda, can you begin your briefing? Can you hear us, Amanda? Oh, hello. Hi, how are you? I've just got you now. Oh, sorry. We maybe had some technological uh, issues there. So, no, it was just uh, welcoming you to the meeting. And if you want to begin your briefing. Thank you very much. Um, so, thank you for inviting me to brief the committee today. I'm very happy to contribute, uh, albeit virtually. Hopefully, we'll, we'll get through it without any more drops. Um, first of all, I just want to thank the committee for uh, their work to date uh, and taking on this complex and, and uh, important, very important task. So I wish you all the best with the mandate. Uh, to begin then, um, I know that the committee has already heard from a wide range of experts um, and many briefings dealing with the complexities, if you like, and the technicalities of how you go about uh, drafting a Bill of Rights and around Amanda. constitutional law. Can, can, have you got speakers on? There's like a bit of an echo coming through. Yeah. Can you hear me okay now? Yeah, I think that's a bit better. Thank you. Sorry for interrupting you. No, that's okay. Um, so today, um, slightly different, I want to focus on the question of the Bill of Rights and human rights uh, through the lens of peace building. And I think uh, most especially I want to look at the role of economic, social and cultural rights and what they can contribute to building a sustainable and peaceful and inclusive society in Northern Ireland. And I think, you know, for some of us we'd say, well, the connection is obvious given that the committee itself is based upon a peace agreement and um but i think often that the efforts to address peace building and the efforts to realize human rights are often the link between these two things is often forgotten or indeed it's taken as so fundamental that support work to support such a relationship uh isn't carried on and isn't explicit so so in terms of the link between human rights and peace building, uh, I'm an international lawyer and a lot of work has been done already on increasing dialogue about how human rights can meaningfully contribute to uh, peace building. And this has resulted in a number of developments at a global level. So we see human rights uh, recognized as essential to sustaining peace. Uh, in new agendas. So the UN Secretary General's new Sustaining Peace Agenda um, of 2016, and then obviously the UN Transforming Our World uh, Sustainable Development Agenda. 
But it's also true to say that much of the focus on human rights and peace building has been on uh, civil and political rights. So there's been quite a significant gap in terms of recognising the role of economic, social and cultural rights uh, in building and sustaining uh, peaceful societies. And there are many reasons for that I'm happy to, to, to look at um, later on in questions. But the emerging evidence is that these rights are indeed crucial if there's going to be uh, conflict transformation, long-term conflict transformation. Um, and that is uh, true in terms of conflict prevention and re preventing a reoccurrence of conflict. Uh, and that's also true in terms of uh, human rights and economic, social and cultural rights being a, a very good vehicle for early warning systems. In terms of peacemaking, of course, in terms of bills of rights or constitutions, if, if they're written constitutions. Uh, but also in terms of development, post-conflict peace building. And there are a number of reasons why this is the case. So first of all, um, these kinds of violations can act as drivers of conflict. So they can be actual root causes causing the conflict in the first place, or underlying grievances, if they're not addressed, can, can resurface and drive ongoing tensions. The second point is that obviously these kinds of violations can be as a direct result of conflict or they can exacerbate existing inequalities. So there's a need to address these violations clearly, but it's also important to note, I think, that economic, social and cultural rights can be part of the transformation on a positive note. So when we think about peace, Certainly, it's not just the absence of direct violence, which of course is very necessary, um, but it's also about the absence of what we call structural violence. So I think economic, social and cultural rights can help address this structural violence, these structural injustices, and also help in practical ways in terms of the prioritis prioritisation of resources um, and using the existing human rights framework to ensure that the voices of those that are the most marginalised are, uh, are heard through special protections and, and the underlying principle of non-discrimination and equality. So moving on from the, that kind of general uh, uh, um, summary, I want to now focus more on, on why they're important for Northern Ireland. So, and I don't want to spend a lot of time setting out the rationale for their inclusion because there's been a lot of work already done, the previous work of the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission um, and, and other uh, bodies and NGOs, of course. But I think it's important to highlight that um, if we think about the report of the Commission in 2008 and now uh, going forward, we're in 2020, that much of the rationale remains the same. So the years of protracted conflict, the effects of violence upon individuals' health and well-being, um, the limited economic development that we've seen in the past, and also uh, the disparities between urban and rural areas, um, uh, the high migration, particularly of youth for employment, um, and of course, continuing structural uh, segregation in housing and education, and the impacts on the already most vulnerable on women and children are notable. But I think importantly, the situation has also been compounded uh, in, in the contemporary context by the financial crisis and the austerity measures that we saw from 2008 onwards, um, the lack of a functioning executive for some time, the most recently, of course, the impact of the COVID-19 global pandemic, which has exacerbated existing weaknesses. And of course, we await to see what the impact of Brexit will be, um, particularly uh, in border areas. So I think the cumul cumulative impact of um, all of this is a lack of enjoyment of economic, social and cultural rights by many. Um, so the question then has to be, you know, how, how do we deal with this? How do we make uh, rights real for everyone in Northern Ireland? How do we make them more than an exercise on paper? 
and that's set out in your new decade, new approach, um, strategy. Uh, we need to think about how best to establish cross community support because it is critical to advancing the Bill of Rights. And here I wanted to talk about, as, as I was asked to talk about my own research, which has been looking at, uh, in particular, uh, Protestant Unionist loyalist communities in rural border areas, although I did actually look at mixed groups as well, um, which illuminated a number of issues about engaging these communities with human rights and economic, social and cultural rights. And really, this is stressing the particular need to engage all sections of Northern Ireland society, including those communities who've traditionally been quite wary um, of human rights and human rights rhetoric. So I, I won't, for time reasons, go into um, full detail. Again, I'm quite happy to take questions uh, and give further detail around this. But to summarise the main findings, everybody that participated in the study was either struggling to realise all of their economic, social and cultural rights in some way, or they were working on the front line helping those who were um, struggling. And I think what was um, quite uh, surprising for myself was the high incidence of rural poverty and also the impact that austerity had had on perhaps those in the community that wouldn't uh, previously have seen economic and social rights as relevant to their lives in particular. What was also interesting though, that there was very firm support for the idea of human rights and support for a Bill of Rights, um, although that was more contentious, but there were a number of obstacles identified in harnessing that support um, for human rights. And those were um, issues such as the previous framing of human rights and political discourse around human rights, limited knowledge and understanding of human rights, in particular economic and social rights, and misconceptions around these rights, but also um, limitations due to the locality and the geography of uh, the rural borderlands. So, it came up several times about limited public transport, about um, a lack of centralised um, or a lack of localised rather initiatives, so that there was limited engagement with any human rights events that were going on um, because they all happened up in Belfast. So um, this lack of lo local initiatives meant there was a lack of local kind of engagement and training and dialogue. Added to that, mistrust was a huge problem. There was a lot of mistrust of human rights institutions, of um, state institutions and NGOs, a perception of bias sometimes, and that even extended to academics. So uh, the other two obstacles I want to mention are cultural and communal norms, and the uh, absence of any leadership or advocacy around human rights within these communities and also on how they could be used to help build peace. So to conclude then, there were a number of actions that can be considered, I think, to advance uh, the Bill of Rights within these communities and generally. I think in the PUL community, dialogue can be enabled through a number of entry points. I think first of all, stressing the universality of rights and using an international human rights standards as a starting point for discussion. Uh, is very beneficial. Um, I also think that uh, focusing discussion on rights that are prioritised by the community themselves, that they can relate to through their own personal experiences, uh, is crucial. So I think human rights need to be relevant for local communities and local priorities. Using alternative language that resonates with the PUL community is also important as a starting point for conversations. So talking about and around fundamental needs, access to services, and values of compassion, humanity, and dignity. Local capacity training and education on human rights needs to take place in localities as well as in urban centres. 
Um, and obviously, um, this will require uh, further investment, perhaps, and engagement with all sorts of stakeholders to try and open up those conversations. And then I think significantly, as I mentioned, leadership from within the community itself is crucial. So de developing some kind of local legitimate voice for human rights mobilization and advocacy is key to bringing everybody on board. Um, I also want to mention the, um, if we go back to the Northern Irish Human Rights Committee um, in 2008, there was a recommendation around the right to be free from violence. And although not strictly economic, social and cultural rights, um, I think this is important in terms of uh, tackling threats to people who speak up on human rights. So uh, back in November 2019, I think, um, I was doing some work with some uh, PUL activists in, in East Belfast, and the problem that was raised there time and again was problem of fear of speaking up on rights, of having that conversation. So I think that needs to be addressed as well. More broadly, I think it's absolutely crucial to take steps um, to promote meaningful citizen participation from all sectors of Northern Ireland society, across all communities, and ensuring most marginalised voices are included. And I think it's also important to think about grassroots work. So we've seen the polls that indicate strong cross-community support for a Bill of Rights, but I think more needs to be done to explore constituent communities, especially in rural areas. So it's about gathering views, but it's also about raising awareness and facilitating and providing information. Um, resource decisions as well, I think, is something we need to, to think about. Using a human rights framework as a lens um, can support investment in regional infrastructure to facilitate engagement with human rights and peace building work. Um, and I think an international framework is helpful here if we think about core obligations and um, uh, and how um, progressive realisation, of course. But um, I also think budgetary analysis, there's been some work done on human rights budgetary analysis. Um, that's also um, a, a useful tool. So I think the committee has a crucial role to play in advocating for economic, social and cultural rights. I think they are essential to the success of building a sustainable, peaceful and inclusive society for everyone in Northern Ireland. And I think these rights should continue to be viewed as an integral and imperative element of peace building policy and practice um, within the Northern Ireland Assembly's work. Um, so I'll finish there and thank you very much and, and look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Cahill Ripley. Um, your, your presentation was useful and, and that was useful as well. Um, you um, are quite clear there about the benefits as you see them from having socioeconomic rights in a situation like ours and in terms of the context of peace building and, and lasting peace. But I wonder if you could give us some detail as to how you think they're best enforced. Within Northern Ireland, sorry. Yeah, within the North, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so I think personally, um, I think they're best enforced as legally enforceable rights within a Bill of Rights. I know there are lots of other models and directive principles, um, but I think the, the problem with not having legally enforceable rights uh, is that the community can see them as, uh, can get disillusioned. So if they're rights on paper, but they can't actually exercise any right to, to individual remedy, then um, I, I think that can be uh, a way to, to, to disillusion people as to, you know, that they can actually exercise those rights in practice. I think the question then becomes one of how do you um, ensure that those rights uh, are, are limited in the way that you want them to be limited and speak to the values of, of the society and the communities um, that are going to access them. So, 
Yeah, so I think they should be legally enforceable. Okay, thanks. So then following on from that and in your research, you talk obviously about the, the different perceptions, particularly from people along the borderlands and in a rural setting that there was this sort of perception or misconception that you know it was something that was Belfast centric, that these groups were only exercising in, in urban centres. And we can see down through the years, obviously, with all sorts of divisions in, in the north, but there's a, a rural urban split or maybe even an east west split um, and different infrastructure investments down through the years have reinforced that and we sort of have systemic almost discrimination or inequality there. How then do you address that through the enforcement of, of rights? How do, you, how do you reach those people? Um, I, I would totally agree with what you said there. I think, I think the interesting ways that that's been addressed in other contexts. So for example, the peace agreement in Colombia uh, included a provision around um, protection of, of an adequate standard of living in uh, rural rural livelihoods, I think was the wording, something around that. So I think it can be a question of um, actually recognising uh, those discrepancies within the actual text of documents, um, within the provisions. But I also think it's about um, ensuring that you have that feed, feed into the process of the drafting of the Bill of Rights and um, I think that involves really an investment in outreach um, uh, and, and gathering views from various groups. There are, a lot, there are a lot of grassroots groups that are working um, in the West in particular with, with where I have the experience and I think gathering those views and um, and also you know discussing discussing what rights means to people um, and you know tackling those misconceptions but as I said I think you know it, it's got to be a question of grassroots up as well and then thinking about how that is reflected in the actual provisions thank you um, I just have one last question so you touched on the I mean, specific outline um, from NDNA in terms of the particular circumstances and then the impact of Brexit. You touched on that lately. How much or less uh, important do you think rights are going to be post Brexit and the impact that the Brexit is going to have on, on a need for a Bill of Rights here? Okay, so yeah, million dollar question. Um, uh, personally, uh, you know, I. Who knows what's going to end up with Brexit, um, given that we're not sure what agreement is going to be in place. However, I do think we're obviously going to lose the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights. Um, we're not going to lose the European Convention. Uh, and you know, we've talked very much in the, in the past about the European Convention on Human Rights Plus. Um, but I think I think it's really important to think that as well about the um, European Social Charter. I think that gets forgotten and that will also still be uh, applicable uh, after Brexit. I think the work of the European Committee of Social Rights is really important in that it has collective complaints uh, mechanism as well as uh, thematic national reporting. So I think um, until, um, you know, um, there's any further moves to withdraw from the Council of Europe, for example, we'll still have those in place. Um, so I think I, I think there will be an impact, um, but I think this, we, we need to be um, we need to be reassured that there are those mechanisms. I think it's important to look at the European Committee of Social Rights in terms of economic and social rights, and then to make sure uh, that the Bill of Rights reflects. Uh, the the added, if you like, values that are applicable for the context of Northern Ireland. Brilliant. Thank you very much. And pass other thank members. You. Mike, Vice Chair, if you want to ask some Chair, thank you, Amanda. Thank you for your, for your presentation. Um, you've detected some sort of a tension in the PUL community between support for rights and support for a Bill of Rights. How, how, mm -hmm. does, how does that come about? Uh, 
well, it came about in, in uh, so it was it's a series of um, interviews, one-to-one -one interviews and um, focus groups uh, with various uh, community groups and various uh, local church leaders, for example. And, and it was really uh, having these discussions about why perhaps rights haven't been uh, utilised so much uh, within that community. And, and around those discussions, what came out of those was that people, I, I think uh, there, were, there were maybe some ideas that people are ideologically opposed to. Uh, human rights, particularly economic, social, and cultural rights. And while there are a few, or my research found that that was a very, very minimal um, resistance or, or opposition to to rights as as an idea. I think uh, when we then went on to discuss the Bill of Rights, that was more contentious because people felt that they either had been excluded from discussions around a Bill of Rights or uh, they agreed with the Bill of Rights again in theory, but then um, felt that they have, there haven't been enough consultation on what should be a part of those Bill of Rights. Um, so, so there was a tension there, and, and whilst I would say my findings uh, were that generally there was support for it, there was more tension around, uh, more let's say, wariness around how that might happen and who would be in charge of that. And I think it's, it's linked to this idea of mistrust of institutions. Okay, thank you. We have to look at uh, the particular circumstances that apply here. Uh, mm -hmm. Is it fair to say that your assessment is that all those particular circumstances arise because we're a divided society emerging from conflict? Um, I think... Um, that while some of those um, particular circumstances can be, say, reflected in, in other parts of the United Kingdom, so for example, austerity measures can be seen as impacting negatively on economic, social and cultural rights in, in England. I think, yes, that the, the history, the background of what's happened in Northern Ireland does make it particular because you're at a different starting point uh, to begin with, because of the years of the protracted conflict, because of uh, the, the reasons I mentioned of um, lack of investment and, um, and you know, um, restrictions on people's uh, lives in the past, I think, uh, and effects of that violence on individuals' well-being. So I do think, yes, they are a result of, of the conflict. Thank you. And finally, in, in terms of economic, social and cultural mm -hmm. rights, um, if we enshrine cultural mm -hmm. rights in statute, how do you assess the implication for bodies such as the Parades Commission? Okay, well, uh, I will say that what my research in particular was very much focused, focused on uh, economic and social uh, and not the cultural. It excluded um, a deep uh, engagement with the culture because I felt um, the the issue of cultural rights demanded uh, uh, attention in its own right because it is contentious. Um, it's a it's a big area, so I have to say that um, my my own project focuses very much on adequate standard of living and the right to health and the economic and social sides, um, and and I haven't worked myself on the cultural rights side per se. Okay. Amanda, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Michelle, I know you were indicating. Okay, thank you, and thank you very much for um, your presentation. I'd be interesting to, interested to know how you carried out your research. I understand it was very focused in around the border areas, but you know, what type of engagement did you have? Did you say who carried out? Sorry. No, just in relation to your research, how did you carry mm -hmm. that out? Okay, so that, the research was carried out it's actually a while ago now, 2015, um, and it was carried out by myself. Um, it was a small pilot study, um, and it engaged with uh, a number of uh, community groups.
groups. So that went from um, victim support groups through to um, uh, uh, people working from based from churches and church leaders, some of the um, frontline workers that were working in food banks, for example, as well. So um, it was a small scale study. Um, and then there were, as I say, one-to-one -one interviews and then some focus groups as well. And the idea behind it was to tap into what I saw a gap uh, in, in academic literature and in the NGO world, the uh, civil society world, uh, in terms of um, looking at this particular uh, area and, and, these, and these people's views. So the idea behind it was then to seek further funding to do a wider study mm -hmm. that would uh, cover uh, more areas within Northern Ireland and ex expand that study to see, to get a more representative sample. Um, so that's how the research was carried out. Okay, and where are you in relation to taking the next step towards doing a, a broader piece of work? So, um, so we'll now be, be seeking, um, I've been after, after I, um, I finished that work, we then went off and I was busy doing work at an international level at the UN. Uh, so that distracted me for a while. Um, but and now um, I'm at a situation where I've just finished some work um, with Poverty Truth Commissions in the United Kingdom. And now I want to try and apply for funding. Obviously, it's a difficult funding um, situation at the moment, but I've really, really uh, like to carry out some wider studies. I think it's really important in light of uh, the mandate for the committee and, and the Bill of Rights more widely. Okay, thank you. Um, one of the comments in, in your paper, it mentions that one of the obstacles, there are obviously a number of obstacles, but one of them is um, the way human rights has been used and framed in political discourse in the past and their association with being pro-Republican or as being anti-state. Could you maybe expand a little on that, please? Yes, sure. So um, I think um, what came through particularly, and I think there was a generational uh, aspect to this as well, but what came through in, in the data and the discussions with people was that they felt very much that um, human rights had been utilised much more by, um, by Catholic nationalist or uh, Republican um, community, that they'd been much more astute in um, exercising um, uh, human rights as a, as a call for addressing their needs. But there was also uh, quite an interesting um, reflection that actually some of that might have been um, sort of self-inflicted, that there'd been uh, a reluctance to engage, say, with, with different human rights um, initiatives. Um, and so, and whilst they Sometimes it was so. For example, the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission, the, they would say, "Oh well, you know, it's biased. It's not for me." Um, they would also then say, "Well, actually, if we tried harder, if we actually engage with these bodies, we might actually get more out of it." So, so it was an interesting discussion around framing, and of course, I think for some of the the. Uh, older generation that that uh, were involved in the study it was very much seen as well the civil rights movement the background maybe uh, to the conflict was something that human rights had become linked very much with with that and that therefore it wasn't it wasn't for them okay well thank you uh -huh. thank you fine. thank you very much um uh, Mike asked my first question, so I'll move on quickly. It's just around the notion that the Bill of Rights could very much contribute to peace building and reconciliation here. And I'm just wondering, I, I myself worked in a PEL committee for 13 years before coming into full-time politics, but it was in an inner city area. And it's really just about picking up some of the words you'd used there around structural injustices and rural poverty. I'm just conscious that we as the legislators and the executive here, we would be responsible then for the allocation of resources. So whether it is building a road out to rural areas so factories can set up there, whether it's building more houses in an in, in inner city. To, to, to what degree, just to come back to the first sentence, to what degree then does the Bill of Rights then to address their understanding of how 
the resources, how devolution works and how decisions are made that they may perceive as injustices but are really based on objective need in terms of how this, this assembly delivers for everyone? Yeah, that's an, it's a very interesting question, I think. I think one of the uh, important things about using a human rights framework is uh, I come back to my point about looking first to the international framework. I think it's useful in that it provides a, um, a framework for core obligations and as this minimum threshold. And I think obviously, you know, decisions have to be made with limited resources and they have to address need. And I think the, the, the value added of that international human rights framework is that it provides for that. It gives you a framework to start from in terms of what, what is the basic minimum threshold uh, that needs to be met. And, um, and that is, um, you know, um, a good base. This is a starting point for then well, and then what can we do on top of that based on need? Um, so I think it, it's important that um, this, the international framework can be utilised um, to help with those kinds of resource alloc allocation um, questions. Yeah, I, I suppose the, the point of getting at is it's, you know, especially in inner city areas where they would see a new housing development across the, the, the divide and they think, oh, well, them's always get everything and we don't. But, you know, it's, it's around how this would actually facilitate that where people do see, you know, we're moving past conflict now and, and people are, we are as an assembly um, using the money to, to make sure that everybody, or, you know, that, that we prioritise the spending of it. So, you know, it's really just about how that would, could contribute to the reconciliation process. But uh, I think, I think, it comes back to this question of, of um, as you say, in, in building trust between, not just between um, communities, but also building trust between those communities and the state. So I think one of the, 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 the things is that if people have, you know, if you can refer to that, well, this is being done um, in, in a fair way in, in adherence with the right provisions, um, they can start to rebuild that trust. Uh, I mean, uh, I think, you know, um, if, if there's transparency and I think if there's a recognition that this is, and training and information sharing about this is the framework we're using, this is how we're going to um, embody it in our Bill of Rights, um, then I think, you know, the argument can be made that this is stuff being done in a fair manner. Thank okay. you. No problem, Paula. Um, we'll go then to the members that are with us via video conference. And Mark? I'm OK. I don't have anything. John? Yes, please. Do you have a question? Can you hear me OK, yeah? We can, aye. Yeah. OK, thank you, uh, Dr. Cahill Ripley. Uh, another interesting presentation to the committee. I find it interesting uh, in terms of when you look at the, what we refer to as the west of the ban, uh, the border communities that, that you were in, uh, the promising unionist loyalist community by and large are now the minority in that region. Uh, and when we concentrate at this stage on, on the assembly and central government, where political unionism still has a majority, though not necessarily in, in the assembly, but that, that overall majority, uh, I think, you know, uh, within that, that unionist community west of the van, their services being run through councils which are largely national and republican run, a bill of rights would actually be a, a, a counterweight to that, a, a protection against abuse of power. Is there any realisation of, of that as we move forward, even in terms of the democratic changes across the north, that uh, a bill of rights is about protecting people from the abuse of power? I think that's a really, really important point, uh, um, and I think it's changed. I mean, uh, my research, as I say, was a few years, a, a couple of years ago now. But I think the realization um, was that of that is 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 coming about, but very slowly. I think the the idea that you know human rights were a tool to bash the state, 
um, uh, this, you know, and it, it's, we're seen as anti-state. I think that's diminishing, particularly with with youth. That doesn't, you know, they don't recognise that. Um, but whether the, that translates into seeing it as a positive protection against abuse, I'm not sure they're there yet. Uh, I think maybe, I think I think it depends very much on the generation of people that you're talking to in terms of age. I think there's a, there seems to be a big disparity between younger people who think about human rights in a much more international way. They think about human rights as being a positive thing, no matter where you are, and then and the older generation who still see it as more contentious. So. Yeah, I think I think that's something that's not fully kind of embraced yet or, or appreciated yet. I also suspect, however, that within the, the nationalist community and indeed the broader community, that the rights agenda is an abstract idea. Um, you only realise you don't have rights until you go looking for them or, or you have been abused by power. And that power might be your local council, your local health service, whatever it may be. I'm not talking about uh, the political power either. So how do we break this down? I, mean, I took a few notes when you were speaking. This is largely in regards to the PLU community, but I think it's across the board. Language, outreach and leadership. How do we make uh, rights relevant to people in the sense of that yeah. they are concerned that either the absence of them or that they're involved, and we will be discussing later on in the committee, how we promote the work of this committee through uh, various aspects. How do they involve themselves in the framing of a relevant Bill of Rights? Yeah, I think absolutely, again, it's it's a crucial question. And I think, um, although austerity has been a terrible, in my opinion, has been a a terrible, the impacts have have been um, deepening and worsening poverty. If there could be a silver lining to austerity, it has been that I think people that would not normally have uh, found it difficult to realise those rights themselves in relation to food uh, is probably the the, uh, the most uh, sta- example that stands out the most. And the, the, so the increased use of food banks, for example. I, I think that, um, again, healthcare has brought people into a context where they're questioning, well, you know, I've worked all my life, I'm still working, but I can't afford to feed my family or I can't get healthcare. And so there's a question about, well, why, why is that? So I think there's, a, there's an opportunity to then say, well, actually, uh, you know, you have a right to these, to right to food, a right, a right to healthcare, um, and and for some people it's like we don't even know that those rights exist. For other people, they like, oh, yeah, you know, but how do I exercise that right? So I think it's a combination of uh, we need to get in there, have these conversations, and I think to do that there's got to be. It's no good me turning and rocking up. <laughs> to try and tell people how to do this. It needs to be people within, like a legitimate voice from within the community that people trust to take on this this uh, role and promote human rights as something that's useful. But alongside that, I think there's a role for others to help with uh, training around human rights and how they can be exercised. And I think that can be through um, civil society organisations. For example, there's a, there's a group in Scotland called Making Rights Real. And they are uh, a new civil society organisation um, that are working to go into communities and, and teach them about their rights and teach them how to exercise those rights. Um, and I think that's really needed. And I know another example, Participation and Practice of Rights in Belfast, done some amazing work but again, those kind of those kinds of initiatives need to be taking place outside of, of Belfast and in these areas. And to do that, it needs engagement from, I think, particularly from um, faith-based groups and community groups 
we need to get those people on board to, to, to help spread that word. Okay. Um, I think there's, there, there's a concern among some that a Bill of Rights denudes or takes away the power or the responsibility of, from politicians that almost uh, we, we, we become rubber stompers rather than legislators, rather than those people who are, who are elected uh, to lead. And I, I have to, I, I'm very protective of the rights of politicians because we have a mandate. We, have, we go out to the people, we get a mandate, we go in and we do our job. Whether people agree with it or not, the best way to deal with that is to either elect or not elect us again. And in terms of nations where bills of, a Bill of Rights have been in place, uh, has it undermined the authority of the elected chamber? Um, well, I think when, I think this comes back to the question around um, separation of powers and justiciability of economic and social rights has always been seen as. Um, controversial because of this issue of, well, will the judiciary, will they get involved in in making decisions that shouldn't be made by the judiciary, that should be made by the legislature? Um, and I think, um, I think it's about getting that balance. I don't think a Bill of Rights of, uh, at all um, absolves politicians of their responsibility to carry out their mandate. I think it's important in terms of um, having a set of uh, not just substantive rights but values that um, again are transparent and that it's a responsibility of politicians but also everybody um, to to realize rights um, and I think um, uh, I think also it's, it's a question of Having a Bill of Rights with uh, justiciable rights is, is something that can deal with rights on an individual level. And so it, it kind of works in two ways, where you've got politicians responsible for setting policy and you've got the, the courts that are there to deal with any individual cases that might arise that can then feed back to politicians if policy needs to be amended or if something's not working. So I don't necessarily see it as being detrimental at all to, to politicians' mandates. I just want to, I'm just looking at the notes here, so excuse me when I turn away, I just want to uh, check one of the... I, do, uh, I think it was around 20... 14, 2015, the Assembly passed the Rural Needs Act and it was pointed out to me earlier today that uh, the interpretation of, of the Department means the Department of Agriculture, but also rural needs, the interpretation of rural needs means the social and economic needs of persons in rural areas. So in one way, in that piece of legislation, the Assembly has already recognised the need for socio-economic rights. Um, and I think you know, once you have pieces of legislation which have been in place for a while, some may argue it's not strong enough and hasn't been uh, used enough, and some of the departments, in my opinion, uh, only play lip service to it. But we have accepted the principle of socioeconomic rights elsewhere, and it is workable, and it doesn't constrain the, the role of government, in my opinion. Yeah. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks a million. Amanda, before I let you go, can I just ask one more question? We are in the process at the minute of uh, working on a public consultation that we're potentially going to put out to the public around what a Bill of Rights would mean and asking people for feedback. Given that you have done a bit of work on this, I'm just wondering if you had any input as to how we're best Framing that, I think someone referred there to the fact that you know rights are seen as quite abstract, and you know unless you're fighting for a right, you're not aware that you, you don't hold it. Is is there a, a way that we can make it accessible to people, or how would you frame it if you were if you were doing a public consultation? Uh, is the public consultation going to be in the form of um, questionnaire, or is it going to be more in depth focus groups, or uh, what? Public consultation will be an online questionnaire. Okay. 
first instance. Okay, so I, I think it's about having, uh, I think it's about having a, a ensuring that the questions uh, are both closed-ended questions, uh, but also some open-ended opportunities for people. I think it's about um, the language you use, um, and I think maybe including questions around not just the Bill of Rights, but what do you understand by human rights? What rights would you uh, identify? And would, whether people have experience, they think of those rights being threatened or violated. So I think maybe starting off at a, a level which um, is, is not, not straight away about the Bill of Rights would be interesting in uncover, uncovering people's views of human rights generally and what they actually understand by human rights before moving on to questions about a specific Bill of Rights. But I'm happy, uh, I'm happy to, to um, send through some, some of the uh, questions that I used in my own research to the committee if that's helpful. I would imagine that would be really helpful. Okay. Thank you. And th thanks uh, in total for everything today. That was a really good presentation. So thanks for. Thanks very much. Good yes. luck. We'll let you go. Okay. Thank bye you. Bye bye. bye. Okay. Um, so the next item on our agenda is chairperson's business, and we don't have any today. And then we've got the draft minutes. So the minutes for our last meeting held on the 17th of September are at page 21 of the pack. If members are content, they are. Right. Perfect. Next, we've got matters arising, and we don't have any matters arising. The sixth item is correspondence. Again, we don't have any correspondence. And so item seven is our forward work programme. Um, I can refer members to the draft forward work programme from page 28. Are members content to note? Content. Perfect. Is there any other business that anyone wants to raise? Um, were we not going to discuss the communications plan today? Yeah, so we're, we're going to do that in an informal session. Oh, sorry, that's okay. That's okay, sorry. Yeah. So the date, time and place of our next meeting will be Thursday, the 1st of October at 2 p.m. when we'll hear from Baroness Helena Kennedy and I'll be Sachs, and that's next week. So if everyone's happy, we'll now move into an informal session. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee.